Tonight, are you prepared to be prepared for what God is calling you to do? Are you ready for your life's calling? And maybe some of you are thinking, oh, I still haven't found that yet. Maybe some of you are like, I, I'm pretty sure I've slotted into my life's calling. Are you ready to be the woman or that man that God has created you to be? Because I really believe that the Lord is going to use even this evening to prepare you for what lies ahead. Now, remember I asked you that question at the beginning, you know, do you know somebody that's in need or somebody that is is needing your help and, and you're in that place where you're the only person available to help them at this moment? Or maybe you wonder, why am I going through these certain things that I'm struggling with right now? And, and you don't understand what that's going to do in the future for you. Well, I need you guys to understand tonight that there is no one on the face of this earth that can do better than you what God's created you to do. You're not replaceable. No one else can do your job. No one else can fulfill your calling. So are you prepared to be prepared for what God has called you to do? I think that you are because I don't think you would have shown up here tonight unless you had a little bit of a desire to receive from the Lord, to open up your word, the Bible, and have your mind washed and your spirit renewed and to be strengthened for what lies ahead. Now, a lot of times we'll look at other people and say, how come I can't do what he's doing? Or how come I don't get to do what she gets to do? Well, let me just tell you, it's not about their calling. It's about your calling. And the greatest enemy of contentment in your calling from the Lord is comparison, where you start comparing yourself to other people. And it's, it's really easy to do, actually. We do it all the time on social media. We'll, we'll get on you know, Instagram or whatever, and there's the highlight reel of that person that we know, and we wonder, how come my life can't be like that? Maybe it would be a good idea to stop looking at other people and what other people are called to do and start focusing on the Lord and say, Lord, what are you calling me to do? Because it's a very special calling. Now, in verse 1, Acts chapter 3, in this message entitled, Be Pre-Prayed, point number one is men of prayer. Men of prayer. In verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And you can write this in your Bible if you like, or if you're taking notes. According to Jewish customs, all the devout men of Israel would stop what they were doing three times a day at 9 a.m., at 12 p.m., and at 3 p.m. to stop and pray to the Lord. And this hour of prayer consisted of 15 minutes of meditation where they would be focusing on the things of the Lord. And this is, according to Jewish custom, 30 minutes of petition where this is the time where you ask the Lord for things. Lord, would you please help me? Or Lord, would you please provide for this? Or Lord, would you please heal this person? And then the last 15 minutes were adoration, which was a time of praise where we're saying, thank you, Lord, for always taking care of me. Thank you, Lord, for always supplying my needs. And you can see how the joy of the Lord starts to strengthen you when you start to thank him for all the things that he has done. And so I would recommend that in your prayer time, that you would take, well, however you would like to fraction it out, that time of focusing on the Lord and who He is. Then making your requests known to the Lord and then praising Him at the end of your prayer time. See, this has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Even back in Daniel, I'll read this to you, you don't have to turn there, in chapter 6, it says, all the governors of the kingdom, the administra uh, administrators and satraps and counselors and advisors had consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except for the king, who we know as King Darius, should be cast into the den of lions. And so King Darius signs this written decree. But then it says that when Daniel, having heard Knowing that this writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, 9 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m., and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. How cool is that? I mean, we usually pray real quick before we eat in and out. Lord, bless this food, nourish it to my body, in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, thank you for this day. We ask you to give us a good night's sleep, in Jesus' name, amen. Peter and John, P 
Peter and John, though they were believers in Christ, they still took time to go to the house of worship. They still went to the temple to pray. See, God uses prayer. God uses prayer to prepare us to be used by him. I think we need to understand that very, very simply tonight. Because if you have a desire to be used by God, the Bible is going to clearly define for us tonight that God uses prayer to prepare you for your calling. So from this day forward, we'll call it pre-prayer instead of prepare. And you're going to remember that probably for the rest of your life, hopefully. Instead of prepare, it's pre-prayer. The Christian gets pre-prayered. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Continuing earnestly in prayer and being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, these disciples were praying. They were earnest in it, and they were vigilant, and they rejoiced. And in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And, and again, if you're taking notes, James 5, verse 15, and it says, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. See, the disciples' time in prayer was the very thing that they needed for what lied ahead. It was preparing them for the very thing that we're going to read about in this story that was just ahead of them. Now, is there anybody here that has played sports at all? Anybody play sports? Okay, let's use a sports analogy. It's the night of the big game. Man, this is such an important game tonight. And so you don't say on the day of the big game that, man, I better start training. I better go run some laps out on the track. I better start doing some weight training and get my cardio up because I got a game tonight. I played college basketball. I remember what preseason was like. I still remember throwing up all the time, thinking my coach hated me because he ran us and ran us and ran us and ran us and ran us in the preseason, over summer, into preseason, before season, because we needed to be ready before the game came. And so often as Christians, we get thrust into the middle of what would be quote unquote the big game, and we're not ready. We're not prepared. We throw up these last ditch, you know, Hail Mary, so to speak, kind of prayers where it's like, oh, Lord, please, I'm in a big, big, big struggle right now. Lord, I need you. But we don't understand that you get prepared for the game. You get prepared for what the Lord has ahead of you through prayer. You need to be prepared up before you actually find yourself in the situation. See, prayer fuels your faith. It puts gas in the tank of your spiritual vehicle, if you will, and it readies us for the journey ahead. See, we store up prayers in advance, just like the athlete trains in the preseason to get ready for season. It's not like, oh man, I'm right here on the, the precipice and I better pray. No, it's like for months I've been praying. Every day I get up, Lord, please strengthen me. I open the word, Lord, please speak to me. I'm ready for whatever it is that lies ahead of me because I have been prayed up. These guys were prepared because they were pre-prepared. For lo and behold, look at verse 2. It says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. This is Acts 3, verse 2. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. This man was paralyzed, as it says. He was born that way. Maybe he had friends or family that would carry him to the entrance of that gate where he could beg and, and maybe support himself. Do you think maybe the sight of this lame man being carried by his friends sparked a memory for Peter? Think about it. New Testament, the Gospels. How about the men that carried their buddy up on top of the roof and started taking the roof apart and then lowered the man down? Do you think maybe seeing this man carried possibly sparked that memory in Peter's mind? 
Maybe Peter waited for this man to be sat down. Well, I can tell you right now that Peter and John didn't scurry off <laughs> in the opposite direction or try to slide by real quick to avoid him. In verse 3 it says, who seeing Peter and John about, this is the, the paralyzed man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, what a scam this guy's running. No, he didn't say that. It says, in fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. And so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And oh, did he ever expect to receive something from them? I think he had no idea what he was even asking. So often, if we're really honest with ourselves, and I've fallen into this too, and so it has to be the same for, for Christians, generally speaking, is that our prayer life is nowhere close to where it should be. I think what we need to start doing is, is being disciplined in our prayer life so we set aside that time to pray so that when the circumstance arises, we're ready for it. That we've already invested that time in prayer. We've already invested that time in the reading and study of God's Word that we're ready when season hits, so to speak. So they were men of prayer. Point number one and point number two in verse 6, they were men of faith. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, we read this in our Bibles and we're like, oh, that's cool. But this is insane. This is insane. Do you understand how crazy this is? I mean, we read the story 15,000 times. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Hey, silver and gold I don't have. And a lot of us can relate to that. But I know what I do have. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Oh, have you ever thought about saying something like that? Have you ever prayed for somebody like, oh, right now, what if I just said, you know, in the name of Jesus... Rise up and walk. Or in the name of Jesus, be healed. But then you have, you know, Satan in your ear. You know he's not going to get up if you say that, right? You're going to look so stupid. Hey, maybe just kind of mumble it under your breath and nobody will hear it. And then that way there's no harm, no foul. Your God's not going to look real. What if you go out there and you say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'm just, just kind of putting myself in Peter's shoes here and think to myself, what happens if he doesn't get up? What happens if all the people that are there now think that Jesus isn't powerful? I mean, no, no doubt. Being a normal human being, there is a barrage of discouraging thoughts in his mind. You know, Peter and John didn't have money, but they were loaded with a spiritual currency called faith. They were loaded with it. That spiritual currency called faith. Furthermore, there's power in the name of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, and I know I'm throwing a lot of cross references out here for you, but you can read them on your own and jot them down. This will give you a, a well rounded picture. It says, Therefore, God has also a highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's power in the name of Jesus. You know, in the world that we live in, there are so many people with foul mouths. Like nowadays, there's not even common courtesy for like women and children to not curse in front of them. Now it's just, you know, people don't care. And it's just the, the society that we live in. But it's gotten to the point now where people don't even bat an eye when they hear swear words. Like we become so numb to those things. But I'll tell you, you go in a public place and you say the name Jesus and everyone's like, what did he just say? And then their ears turn up. You say the name Jesus. You might as well be like having a live grenade and be like, fire in the hole. You know, like you just say the name Jesus and people stop. 
and they're almost shocked and they're taken back by it. There's power in the name of Jesus and that is who has made you alive spiritually and who has given you the Holy Spirit as that guarantee, that seal that you're his son and that you're his daughter, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. That's who we serve. This isn't like, hey, let me go play church, man. Like, I know God, and I know him personally because I have faith in Jesus. Furthermore, these men that were men of prayer and men of faith, they heard what Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, where he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And this is the key phrase. For without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Are you relying on the strength of your flesh to not fulfill the lust of your flesh? I can, I, I can handle this. Uh, you know, I, I think I got this. You know, I was listening to this, this study by Warren Wiersbe today. It was to pastors. Man, what a great speaker he is. And... Uh, it's really cool because I, um, I, was on, I was on the treadmill this morning, and I really dislike treadmills, like a lot. Like walking nowhere for a long time is really frustrating to me. But if I put my earbuds in, you know, and I'm listening to the study, and he said, strength that knows itself as strength is weakness, but weakness that knows itself as weakness is strength. And it really stuck with me today. Because you might think, I'm strong, and I know I'm strong, and you're weak. But you might say, hey, I'm weak, and I realize that weakness, and there I find God's strength is made perfect in me. Because without Jesus, we can do nothing. And we might, want, we might say all that, I mean, we could say all that we want. I mean, I want to be used by the Lord. I want to be used by God, but we don't pray. We don't step out in faith. And I'm not talking about, you know, raising people from the dead even. I'm just saying, taking those little steps of faith. And this isn't, you know, the, the, the night that you come to church and get a verbal shellacking. For psh, psh, psh. You know, you don't pray. Listen, we all can pray more. We all can. But I think we need to understand the concept of being prepared and being prepared for what the Lord has for us comes through our time in the word and time in prayer ahead of time before the scenario hits. Right? Because most of the time it's reactionary. I get hit in the face with something. Oh, Jesus, please save me. And that's okay too. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Romans 10. But we can be prepared for our calling through our time in prayer and through stepping out in faith. And it says in verse 7, And he took him by the right hand. So Peter takes this man that's paralyzed after he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He takes him by the right hand and lifted him up. And it says, And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so... He, leaping up, stood up and walked and entered, entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Wow. He went walking and leaping and doing the running man and praising God. And it says all the people who saw it in verse uh, 9 there, it says they, they praised God. They saw it and they said, hallelujah, what great things God has done. Because weakness that knows itself as weakness is strength. And then who gets all the credit when the weak vessel is used by God in a mighty way? Who? God. You're not going to be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I am pretty good. I mean, God definitely exercised wisdom when he called me to, to be a servant. You know, or whatever it might be. You know, the, the, the point is, is that we are prepared we didn't see it coming either. And most often, that is the case. We don't see it coming. God knows what's going to happen ahead of time, but he prepares us in advance. And so the people saw him walking and praising God, and they praised God. And then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Wow. Wow. 
Now, you don't need to share out loud. You don't need to raise your hand or anything. But when was the last time you saw God do something amazing in your life? Or in someone else's life around you? I think we forget about those things all too easily. Because do you remember the time where you were at the end of your rope and somehow God came through and you praised God and you thought how miraculous this is and how much you were praising the Lord only to forget about that the next time something came around? I've been like that. I don't know if you've ever been like that. Or how quickly we forget how God takes care of everything that we need. Well, Lord, I know you did it last time, but what about this time? This is a little bit different. Lord, I know you provided for me back then, but what about right now? You know, one of my, my good friends, and you know, I would even say a mentor that had helped me through a lot of things in my early years of ministry, and still does even to this day. Um, he's in his 70s, and him and his wife had just found themselves where their landlord basically said, you're out, here's your notice, and um, he's on disability. She, she teaches you know, part-time tutoring and these kind of things, and so they were having a really hard time finding a place to live. They got all the way down to where they packed up all their stuff and moved out, and now they were in a Motel 6. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, and I don't know how you're going to provide, Lord. Lord, you always have, but Lord, look at where we're at now. And they, they were, back, I mean, their backs were up against the ropes. And if you think about it, if you're in your, you know, 70s, and you have some physical disabilities, and you're thinking, how I can't even really provide for myself. Where am I going to find a place in Orange County that I can actually afford with my, my income that, that's, you know, that stable income, but it's, it's low? What, what am I going to do? And they were having a really hard time. And we were praying for them. We were praying with them. And it just so happened that one of the, the students that she tutors, um, that student's parent said, hey, we have this house with a granny flat, and we're going to move you in it. And not only are we going to move you in it, we're going to give you a new car, because their car about bit the dust. And we were just tripping out. Like, it was unbelievable. But Lord, I'm in a Motel 6 now. Lord, where are you? And then we had this epiphany when we were talking. Do you realize that two years ago when you started tutoring that student, that God knew that that student's parent was going to be the one that would help you when you were out and living in a Motel 6? And then from hindsight, you're just blown away. The Lord actually gave you that job tutoring that particular student so that a couple years later down the road when you're in a Motel 6, they would say, we want to move you into our granny flat and give you this car. How amazing is that? Pastor Chuck said, and I quote, the secret to great faith is being fully and totally persuaded that God is both willing and able to intercede in your situation. End of quote. So we see that there are men of prayer and that there were men of faith. And thirdly, our point number three from verse 11 now is men of humility. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? I mean, could you imagine the crowds thronging you saying how amazing you are? I mean, wouldn't there be just the little temptation to be like, oh, thanks. You're welcome. You know, I'm glad to be here. I'll be here all day, you know, or whatever it might be. See, the temptation is this. Whenever the Lord is working, there is always some sort of opposition that Satan throws our way. In back, just the chapter over in Acts chapter 2, and you guys probably remember this, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and people were speaking in tongues that were not their own, heavenly tongues, and they were worshiping, and then all the people that were there from different parts of the, of the world heard praises to God in their 
native tongue. Do you remember what happened at that point when the Holy Spirit fell? There were mockers. They said, oh, these guys are a bunch of winos. They're full of wine. The discouraging words against the work of the Holy Spirit. But here in chapter 3, so you, you, you'll see two kinds of, of temptation from Satan where, you know, this testing that will come to discourage you, testing that will come to mock you. But in chapter 3, we see a completely different form of the spiritual attack used by Satan to counteract this. Uh, this real, really was a miraculous occurrence, and it's glory. Glory. See, the crowd is tempted to glorify the man, and the man is tempted to receive it. The crowd's tempted to glorify the man, and then the man's tempted to receive it. The glory should only be given to God and should only be received by him alone. In Revelation, to this effect, verse 11 of chapter 4, it says, as they're praising God, it says, to, it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. God, you're worthy. Man, I might have a big problem, but I serve a big God. There might be a great need, but I have a great God. And I see these things in light of how great God is. And when I see my weakness and understand my weakness to be weakness and my need for the Lord, there is strength. In James 4, verse 10, it says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. You don't need to promote yourself. I mean, nowadays it's self-promotion all over the place. I mean, everywhere. Self-promotion, self-promotion, and you're just thinking, man, is this the most stuck-up, conceited person I've ever known in my life? But you have to do that to get ahead. You got to do that now, right? Promote yourself. No, the Lord says, humble yourself. He'll lift you up. Because Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 3, verse 34 says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. That's what we want. That's what we need. Remember, I asked you at the beginning, I said, are you prepared to be prepared for what God's calling you to do? Are you ready for it? Some of you are like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I've deposited enough prayers in that, in that bank yet. You always can start now. Lord, I'm going to be consistent in praying. I'm going to commit this day to you. I'm going to pray for my wife. I'm going to pray for my husband. I'm going to pray for my kids. I'm going to pray for my work. But I haven't met my husband yet. You can still pray for him because God knows who he is, and that's not going to change once you get married either. You better be praying for him. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. I remember a story of, of two young pastors uh, that were pastoring, and uh, they were asked to, to empty all the trash um, at the church. And there they were in there. It was a, it was a pretty formal church, and um, they were in their suits and ties and all this kind of thing, and the trash was overflowing. You know, you get the picture. You know, like the big, uh, you know, big crowd-sized trash, and somebody had thrown some coffee in it with a full coffee, and it's leaking everywhere, and maybe somebody had tossed a diaper in there, or whatever it might have been. You just didn't want to, it was Sunday morning, and obviously the two young guys, yeah, you two uh, go empty the trash, and they're picking the trash out, and their suits are getting soiled, and they're like, ah, oh, what is this, you know? And uh, the story goes on, and I'll just paraphrase it for you, but um, that basically the, the, the pastors were like, you know what? Nothing should ever be below us. And they came to that point where they, they thought, nothing should ever be below us. Like, if the Lord called us to do this, then suits or no suits or dress shoes or no dress shoes, we're going to handle this. And then the story goes on that, that one of those pastors ended up starting a church that had thousands and thousands of people come. The other pastor ended up just shortly thereafter, I guess, spoke at this event where there was 10,000 people in the stadium. And it was all these two young, obscure guys. Let nothing be below you. And then also know that something that's beyond you, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So be a man or a woman of prayer. Be a man or a woman of faith. And be a man or a woman of humility. 
It's by God's grace that we're ever, uh, even able to, to participate in the things that God is going to allow us to participate in. Because if it were up to us, we'd be done. If it were up to us in our own, righteous stand, our own righteousness, we would not meet the standard. We would be disqualified. So be humble before the Lord. No one does this to me. No one. You know, I remember this uh, usher who was on an Easter. This is, I know personally because I was there. Um, there was an usher at our Good Friday service or was, yeah, I think it was actually uh, Easter Sunday service at the Verizon Wireless Amphitheater. And there was an usher up in the nosebleed section. Like it was way, way out. And I just happened to be walking through and saying hi to people. And he just looked really upset. And I said, hey, man, what's wrong? He's like, oh, man, they stuck me up here in the nosebleed section. And he was all upset about it. And, I, and, and he goes on to say, you know, my, my services could best be used up in the front. And I just looked at him and I was like, well, you're, and I thought to myself, well, you're actually in the exact spot that you should be. And you think about that. My services should be up in the front where people can see me or don't you know how important this is or, or I am or whatever. No, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Let the Lord lift you up. You don't need to promote yourself. Let the Lord bring the increase. Be that man or woman of prayer and of faith and of humility. And then fourthly, be that man or woman of the word. That's point number four. It says in verse 13 as now Peter starts to draw on his knowledge of the Old Testament. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you, he says to them, to the crowd, to those Jews, you denied the Holy One and the just, and you asked for a murderer whom we remember as Barabbas to be granted to you. Verse 15, and you killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this soundness in the presence of you all. These men pointed to God. These men understood what the Bible had to say about the Messiah. They understood exactly what it meant to be a servant of the Lord because it's in Jesus' name and it's through faith in Jesus' name and all glory to Jesus' name. And Peter continues on in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, talking about crucifying Jesus, as did also your rulers, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Saying, in your ignorance, meaning, I know you really were unaware of what was really happening, and you were swept away by what the other people were saying or doing. That is contrary to the plan and purpose of God. So he says in verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Right there. The good thing that he did was used as a platform to tell people about Jesus. Now, Humanitarian aid is a great thing. Bringing clean water, bringing a pair of toms, building a schoolhouse, all that stuff is fantastic. But humanitarian aid is not a replacement for a personal relationship with Jesus. In our world that is caught up with social justice and all of these things, it's infiltrated the church where now we think that it's actually more important to do these good deeds than to tell people about who Jesus is. Because if you think about it, I could build a roof over their head. I could give them clean water to drink, nice clothes to wear, shoes on their feet. I could fix all the cavities in their teeth. And they'll still die in their sins unless I tell them who Jesus is and what he's done for them. 
These things that we do that are good should be used as a platform for proclaiming the gospel, even as Peter did here. This miracle that was brought, he he used it to point people to Jesus. He used it to share the gospel with them. So let me ask you the question again that I asked at the beginning. Are you prepared to be prepared? What is going on in your life that would drastically affect the rest of this year? Drastically affect how the Lord uses you? Are there hidden sins? Are you addicted? Are you prideful? Are we lacking faith? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because I don't think any of us just want to be churchgoers. I think we want to see the Lord do great and mighty things. I think furthermore, we don't just want to see it. We want to be involved with it. We don't just want to be involved with it. We want to facilitate it. We want to be those men and women that are vessels of righteousness that can be used and a powerful way as a conduit of the Holy Spirit ministering to the people around us. We want that. I know you do. I know there's just even that little spark of a desire. Maybe your faith's even being increased this very moment and you're thinking, maybe I could be like that. Maybe God could use me. I guarantee you he can. He desires to. But the first thing that Peter says here, he says is repent. It's the act of turning from your sin. Stop pursuing your sin. Stop going in the direction that you're you're going in. You know, if somebody were to say, you know, repent or or turn from your sin, logically we could could deduce that that person's in sin if somebody say, if someone's saying turn from sin, turn from your sin. It would be like if somebody was, was caught up in alcohol, turn from your alcoholism. Or, you know, if I'm at this podium, turn from your podium. Or, you know, if you have a mullet, turn from your mullet. Like that kind of a thing. Now, just as a side note, mullets aren't sinful. I understand you have to be like Paul where he said, I need to be all things to all men that I might win the more, right? And that can mean hairstyles as well. But he says, repent, turn from your sin, Ezekiel 33, verse 11, it says, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. So turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? And we know, as we're wrapping up here, and I know we're, we're hitting the timeline. We're just past it. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because sin takes a toll. Please, you don't need to raise your hand, but you know what it's like giving into sin and the emptiness it brings and then the discouragement and the oppression. Sin takes a toll physically, emotionally, mentally, and of course spiritually because we're all interconnected. That's why when you sin, it affects your whole being. Even things that are private, it affects who you are. That's why, you know, you see, and, you know, social media can be a great thing or a not so great thing. You know, you get connected, you know, with people from your past and and that can be good or not good. But you see that those who continue just partying on and drinking and doing drugs and even living in sexual uh, sin, it, it appears, you know, you see these photos of people and even come in contact with them personally that they're not only unhappy, but they've aged immensely. Immensely. They literally look like they've taken a beating from from life. And you see these people, and then you understand where that term ugliest sin came from. Like they hit every branch on the way down. You know? I mean, there's nothing like being asked if you want the senior citizen menu at Denny's, and you're only 27. You know, it's bad. But that's what happens. Like sin takes a toll. And not only we take a beating in this life because of sin, your sin will lead you to God's judgment. So that's why Peter says, hey, you guys may have done this ignorantly. Whatever the case may be, you need to turn from that. See, you're here at church tonight to get ready. You know, like an MAA fighter or a boxer, how you get challenged and you get pushed and you get conditioned. And every single day, For the Christian, there's an opportunity for spiritual growth. So repent. Be converted. Some people might say, you know, I've tried to get clean. I've tried to change my life. I've tried to get myself together. 
you know, I've, I, I've tried all those things. You need to change your, your whole way of thinking. Maybe it's a belief system. Maybe it's just your way of living and you're stuck in this rut of doing things that are destructive. That's why it says in Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You get to prove it. You. You. You get to. What a great privilege. Have your sins blotted out. And then the thing that we're going to close with tonight is just that time of refreshment. Isaiah 1.18, the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So he says, repent therefore, be converted, turn your way that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's what we want. That's what we want. Times of refreshing, of refreshing and refreshment from the Lord. Because we work all day, we're in the world all day, we get beat down, we need refreshment. We need to be refilled. That's why I applaud you for being here tonight and being at church when you're tired. Being committed to being at church. For a pastor to show up and to see people in the audience is just so much better. Because it would be a lot different if you weren't here. For the people that came and they see you across the aisle, oh, hey, so-and-so's here. It's way better for them because they see you here than to look over with a tear in their eye. Where are they? You know? So your presence here, even you sitting by yourself right there in your seat, is good for everybody else around you. So are you prepared to be prepared for what God's called you to do? I think you're on the right track. But you need to be a man or woman of prayer. You need to be, you need to be a man or woman of faith. A man or a woman of humility. And a man or a woman of the word. So maybe you're going through preseason conditioning right now. Hold on. Lord, what do you want me to learn through this time? Lord, prepare me for what lies ahead. It's going to come through your time of prayer. So be pre-prepared for what the Lord has ahead.